Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for the uh, today's focus webinar. My name is Daria, and I'm the Global Learning Program Manager with Ponkus Certification Academy, and I will be your webinar host for today. The webinar is now beginning, so all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box for any questions or chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. This presentation will include a PowerPoint presentation and time for questions and answers at the end. And today's topic is POCUS and deep vein thrombosis, and our speaker is Dr. Leandro Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez is the professor and a director of laboratory of vascular sonography in La Foresta Medical Institute in Caracas, Venezuela. He's a renowned international speaker and also founder of Sonia Imagine. Sonia Imagine is a digital platform for courses and training in Doppler ultrasound, and they are also official focus education provider with uh, the academy. Uh, welcome, Dr. Fernandez. We're so excited to have you today. Um, thank you so much for joining everyone. Welcome. Hello, Daria. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. So let's share the screen. And here we are. Well, as I said, thank you so much, Daria, for your kind introduction. I want to welcome you all for this uh, webinar organized by the POCUS, Point of Care Ultrasound Certification Academy. It is my privilege to be here and have the opportunity to discuss on the topic POCUS in deep vein thrombosis of lower limbs. I'm Leandro Fernandez, director of Sonrimagen Global Ultrasound Academy from Caracas, Venezuela. Let's begin uh, by defining what point of care ultrasound is. POCUS is defined as ultrasound performed at the bedside of where the patient is. To answer specific clinical questions, to guide the treatment or establish the clinical conduct to be followed is a target and focused exam. And one of the most important characteristics is this one here. This is a binary study. There is or there is not a pathology. A pathology. The, uh, the, the study is positive or negative for a given disease. In our case today, for DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So remember that is a binary study. There is or there is not. Please allow me to say some information regarding the deep vein thrombosis, DVT. The global incidence is 100 to 200 uh, cases uh, per year uh, correlated with 100,000 in inhabitants per year. It can vary. It. These numbers can vary depending on the country. But something that it's always uh, the same behavior is the age. If you study the po a population under 15 years old, uh, the incidence is five uh, each 100,000 inhabitants. But if you study population over 80 years, uh, so we can now have 500 ca cases per 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, between 300 to 600,000 uh, uh, cases per year can be found in the United States. But some authors say, some authors say that it can be, or it can reach, it can reach 2 million. 2 million people affected with the disease. The explanation is sub-diagnostic. In, in the European Union, uh, there are 460,000 cases reported annually. And this number is very close also uh, in Latin America at this moment. The DVT has consequences. I can mention the most important, 
pulmonary thromboembolism in 35 to 50 percent of the cases. So it means that in the United States, we can have 300,000 deaths in a year in this country. Uh, another, another problem is that the DVT causes chronic venous insufficiency. And then we have the post-thrombotic syndrome in 29 to 50% of the cases. So it's an important pathology that uh, this uh, disease needs to be uh, an opportune diagnostic and of course the proper treatment uh, as soon as possible. So in this moment, currently, ultrasound is the method of choice for venous study of lower limbs. What kind of systems, which is the equipment necessary to perform POCUS in order to uh, uh, make an assessment for DVT? Well, the minimum ultrasound system, it's much better if the system is digital, but can be uh, but analogic systems can be also used with no problem, but digital is better. It's necessary to have high resolution and how you can obtain high resolution by using a linear probe with 10 or more megahertz. Now at this moment, all the vendors offer 10 megahertz, at least uh, many companies offer 12 megahertz. But I think that the message here is, please don't use a frequency less or lower 10 megahertz. With seven megahertz, probably you will miss information. So go and use linear pro uh, of 10 of, with 10 of more megahertz. It's necessary that the system of the equipment uh, has 128 channels. You can use car-based portable or ultra-portable systems. In this picture here, we are showing a system, uh, wireless connecting with your smart device, can be a phone or can be a tablet uh, by, using, by using Wi-Fi. This is one of the ultra-portable. But we can use, as I said, we can use the car-based. This, <clears throat> this kind of system, it has wheels, we can, you know, take the, take, take, we can take the system to every part of our hospital, our offices. So you can use this more, this more robust uh, kind of uh, system, but you can use also the portable like this one or the ultra portable as I mentioned before. So in this case, we are showing here a very popular system uh, it's a wire system. You can connect it to your smartphone or to your tablet. And here we have a couple of examples with a convex and a linear probe connected to a tablet also. So it means that you can use any kind of system of systems and you will be uh, you will obtain the proper kind of image necessary to do a very good diagnostic. There is no doubt that the position, the patient's position for the scanning, for the DVT scanning is the patient in supine position. So the patient is laying down. And then please notice that we have a very mild, a very uh, mild flexion of the knee. And here we have a rotation of all the leg, uh, external rotation. This position will, allow you to make and perform the, uh, the DVT scanning. It doesn't matter the type of DVT scanning do you want to do. Now, we will see what the different protocols that you can be used in order to, uh, to obtain uh, the positive or negative uh, POCUS uh, study. Well, if you go to the, uh, to the inguinal region, we can go here to the groin area, the inguinal, you will see, oh, we have to look for Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse is a character very well known all around the world. We have the face of Mickey Mouse and we have two ears of Mickey Mouse. Then now let's see, 
not the face. Let's see the shape of Mickey Mouse, the face and the two ears. And now please uh, see the Mickey Mouse that we can obtain with our B-mode ultrasound. With a linear probe, with the right mark or the mark of the, of the linear probe uh, pointing to the right of the patient if we are using the transversal position like this one. And we can obtain the shape of Mickey Mouse. The shape of Mickey Mouse, we will see the details. We have the two ears and we have the face here. And after the identification of this curious shape, we can proceed to do our test. Here we have a video uh, provided by the, one of the vendors. And here we have the Mickey Mouse and now we are compressing the region. When we do, uh, when we do the, compre the compressive maneuver, the idea is try to collapse the vein walls. Let's see a little bit more. Let's continue now with the animation. Remember, the mark is pointing to the right of the patient. Please place the transducer in the inguinal region. We have here all the elements, all the components. Again, Mickey Mouse, face of Mickey Mouse. Let's start with one of the ears. This ear here corresponds to the uh, femoral artery, common femoral artery. And here the face is the common vein the femoral common vein, and here is the saphenous vein. In fact, is this, this is the saphenous femoral confluence. And what do we do? We look for some echogenicity inside. There is or there is not echogenicity inside the vessel. And then we go to the compressive maneuver. So the compressive ultrasound maneuver. Uh, or protocol, uh, we have to compress every two centimeters from proximal or distal. So we locate, we locate the Mickey Mouse, make the compression. And if you are going to do an extended type of a study of assessment, you have to go every two centimeters and make the compression in each part of the region. Usually, uh, these uh, this exam is done. Uh, from proximal to distal. But if some sonographers prefer to do it from distal to proximal, this is valid, but we uh, recommend to make it, and we do like that, from proximal to distal. In many countries, especially in the United States, uh, only the symptomatic leg is, uh, is explored. But in some other countries, and I feel myself more comfortable, more confident, when I explore the two legs, but it is valid and many countries only uh, make the assessment on, uh, on the symptomatic leg. In this picture here, we can observe where we can place, where we can place uh, the probes, the transducers. So we start in the inguinal region uh, and some people jump directly to the popliteal area two points or two regions. I will explain that in detail. Uh, and some authors recommend to make also an assessment in the medial portion of the thigh. Regarding the compressive ultrasound protocol, if we explore, if we do a whole leg compressive ultrasound, it can exclude proximal and distal DVT in a single assessment. But if we have a symptomatic patient with an initial negative compressive ultrasound, this patient will require a control. It's necessary to repeat the test in five to seven days if we don't have the answer, if we, have, if we don't have or identify the cause of the symptoms of this patient. Uh, this method has a, a very high specificity and a very high negative predictive value. So if the 
compressive ultrasound protocol is negative, in most of the cases, this patient has no DVT. Let's see the POCUS protocols. So we have the two points that really they are not points. They are regions, the inguinal and the popliteal regions, inguinal and popliteal region. Some authors recommend it to do three regions, inguinal, thigh, and popliteal. Some of the authors, they recommend to do an extended focus protocol up to the tibial, peroneal, and the muscular vein confluences. So go a little bit further uh, or down, go a little bit down to the tibial, peroneal, and muscular confluences. And some of the other authors, they recommend to do a complete inguinal to the ankle. It is really a more complete, no doubt about that, but it takes more time. If you do two regions, or if you do three regions, you are doing a good and a validated protocol to work with. Let's see this diagram here. This is a very schematic uh, uh, representation of the veins of one lower extremity. We have the common femoral vein, then we have the great saphenous vein, femoral vein, popliteal vein, and here we have the confluences, the tibia, uh, the tibia peroneal uh, confluences, and here we can observe also uh, the peroneal vein and the posterior tibial vein. So if we work with the two points, they go, or we go just to the inguinal region and check here, the common femoral vein and the and the, the and the great saphenous vein and part of the femoral vein also and then we skip or we jump and then we go to the popliteal vein. If we do the three points, remember that we can place or we can place the transducer here in the middle portion of the thigh. The extended uh, protocol recommend recommends to go all way down, all the way down until popliteal region and until the TP. And the most complete uh, study from inguinal region to the, to the ankle and using color Doppler and using uh, pulsed, pulsed Doppler is a very complete, uh, is a very complete study, but we have to recognize that not all the physicians are prepared to do pulse Doppler and to prepare to, to deal with the color Doppler. So if we, you don't, it's not necessary, mandatory to, for POCUS DVT to make the assessment with, with Doppler. If we do two points or three points, this is good. I recommend to do extended, it's much better. If you find the expression four points, this expression refers to two points in one leg and two points in the other leg. So we are exploring the two lower uh, limbs uh, with two points each one. So here we can see the compression maneuver in the video. So we have here the two years, we have the face of Mickey Mouse. And now the first compression maneuver was too strong. So we collapsed even the artery. The second time, more gentle. So we, can, we could compress the femoral vein and the saphenous vein. No echogenicity inside and the compression maneuver is normal. So we call it negative. Another example, here we have some uh, uh, part of the saphenous vein di dilated with some tributaries here. Now we can observe the confluence. Now we can observe the confluence. And let's see how the compression, oh, well, I showed, I showed it before. Let's go back 
And then let's try again to do. Now it's it's running. Okay, here we have the Safedus confluence, Safedus femoral confluence, and we can do a normal compression maneuver. In this case, now we have, now we have some echoes. We have some echogenicity inside the saphenous femoral confluence with no compression and here with compression. So we collapsed the face, we collapsed the femoral common vein, but we couldn't collapse the saphenous vein. Attention here is this a saphenous, but we are, we are showing the confluence very proximal to the uh, common femoral vein. When you have a thrombus, this is a thrombus, with a distance less than two centimeters from this uh, deep vein, uh, the femoral vein, I mean, the femoral common vein, uh, this thrombus must be considered a DVT and it is necessary to initiate anticoagulation. If, uh, if uh, you are the physician performing the study in your patient with a POCUS protocol, start the anticoagulation. Or please notice to the referral doctor uh, this kind of result in order to start the treatment, the necessary treatment. Can we estimate the age of the thrombus by using beam out ultrasound? Yes, we can do it. So we have some characteristics here that allows us to uh, define the thrombus as, as a recent thrombus. The thrombus can be anechoic or anechogenic. The both expressions are, uh, are valid. So can be anechoic or hypoechoic. When the thrombus is so, so fresh, so, so recent, you cannot see it, but the thrombus is in the vein. And when you try to make the compression maneuver, the compression maneuver is positive. So it's impossible to uh, collapse the walls. The thrombus, the reason thrombus, is homogeneous, poorly adherable. It's a floating thrombus with smooth edges. Thrombus is fluffy and deformable. And attention, the vein is dilated and the vein is painful when you try to do the compression. It's a very, a very uh, important uh, characteristic. Uh, uh, and if the thrombus is old, let's see how the thrombus changes. From an echoic or hypoechoic, the thrombus now is hyperechoic. From it was homogeneous and now is heterogeneous. Uh, now it's adhered, so it means that the, thromb the thrombus now is firm with irregular edges, is rigid and not very deformable. And attention, the vein is not dilated anymore. Now we have a contracted vein and no pain when we do the maneuver. So this how we can uh, estimate the age reason or old thrombus and, what it, and why this uh, differentiation uh, is important because if the reason thrombus, you need to start anticoagulation. Let's see some example of reason thrombus. Uh, we started the maneuver in transversal, but then you can turn to the longitudinal position if you want to see the extension of the thrombus and here we are observing the saphenous, the great saphenous vein with parts anechoic, and with parts anechoic, with parts with uh, isoechoic, isoechoic, and some parts are, hypo are hypoechoic. So it's a combination of different kinds of signs, but this is a recent thrombus. Here we have a recent thrombus also. Uh, is very well, uh, it, it has, uh, it is well limited, uh, but the, the clinical signs started very recently. Please see that 
this is a muscular vein. This is a gastrodemius vein uh, in the calf. So it is a good it, uh, practice to go to the calf. Go to the calf as sometimes or many times you will find the answer of the uh, symptoms. And another thing quite important, please place the transducer where the patient refers pain. If they say, doctor, I have pain here, please play the trans place the transducer there, okay? With no doubt, in order to try to find the answer, the clinical answer. A very recent thrombus, this is a nurse, a nurse of one uh, in, in, in my hospital. And she had pain. She had pain. Uh, and she asked us for an evaluation. And we performed this, ultras this ultrasound. Uh, and this is the gastronomous vein, muscular vein, with this very, very homogeneous and very, very low echogenicity thrombus with compression maneuver uh, positive. Uh, without possibility to collapse the uh, walls. Attention, if you find, if you uh, find a thrombus that you suspect that it's a fresh thrombus, is a recent thrombus, please don't do the compression maneuver so uh, in, in very aggressive because is this written on the literature that it is possible to fracture the thrombus and then you will uh, cause uh, embolism. Part of the thrombus can go even or up the lung. So attention, don't be so energy. Don't do a very energy man maneuver in these cases. Now we are using Doppler. We decided to use it. It's just to press the button. We have the popliteal vein in transversal plane. We have two gastronomous veins. One it's okay with color Doppler inside, but the other one has the same echogenicity inside, thrombus inside the popliteal and thrombus inside one in one of the gastronomous veins. Uh, here, this is the artery. We, this is the reason because the codification is, is different. Uh, and uh, in this case also, of course, the compressive maneuver was uh, positive. Uh, in, impossible to uh, to um, to collapse the veins. If you have the Doppler, if you know how to deal with the Doppler, just press the button. But I will tell again, for focus on the assessment of DVT with B mode and compressive maneuvers is enough. Attention with this kind of image that you can find. Again, we are in the calf. We are observing here dilated veins, muscular veins, and we have this echogenicity inside with very slow movements, up and down, up and down movements. And you can think that you can think that probably could be a thrombus. But if you do the compression maneuver, let's see how the veins can be perfectly collapsed. So the internal echoes disappear and they appeared again. They appeared again and filled all the veins when we suspended the compression maneuver. So this is called slow flow. It, it is necessary to establish some kind of treatment for this patient because if, you, if we don't do anything, Probably this patient will have a thrombosis in this area. So just to remind you, and this is the take home message, how to do and how to expect with the result. We have here a free veins, normal vein with no echogenic material. And here the vein collapse collapses perfectly with the compressive maneuver because it's normal, no echogenicity inside and normal compression. In this case of a non-obstructive thrombus, a partial thrombus, you see the echogenicity inside and when you try to make the compression, so we have a very partial or very limited uh, 
recuperation. And here we have an obstructed thrombus that can be, depending on the characteristics, can be recent, acute, or can be old, chronic. So we have the vein, we have the material inside, and when we tried to make the compression, the compressive maneuver, so it's impossible to do the maneuver. Remember that in acute thrombus, recent thrombus, the vein is dilated and the vein is painful. And in chronic, the vein is uh, reduced in diameter and with no pain. So venous ultrasound has disadvantages. It is not perfect. It's uh, operator dependent. You, you, you need to know what you are looking for. You need to make a learning curve and then go to get your diagnostic. So is operator dependent? The sensitivity and specificity decrease in edema, in lipodermatosclerosis, obesity, uh, and also in some immobilization uh, cases. For example, patients uh, with, a, with a cast or uh, patient uh, with surgical material in a post post operatory uh, uh, moment moment uh, so in these cases we have a decrease of the sensitivity and specificity but we have very very good advantages the assessment is accessible it's portable we have the portable and ultra portable systems so it is available it is painless with no risk or side effects because we don't have radiation. And one of the best, we can obtain immediate results. Remember, binary, there is or there is no. And this is the first choice method for the assessment of patients with DVT. And with this last slide, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you so much for the Focus Ultrasound Certification Academy for the kind invitation. And now I am open to uh, receive some questions. But first, we have an exercise for you. We have some questions, multiple choice for you. And then I will answer the questions. Yes, Please I'll do. launch this question right now. So here's the first question that you should see on your screens. What is the recommended patient position to perform a POCUS DVT study? So if you can take some time to answer these questions and sort of do like a quick knowledge check with us. And I see everyone is responding. Um, we have about 50% who responded. Uh, so I'll give another five seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. And here are the results for you, Dr. Fernandez, to comment. Very good. This is the correct answer. Uh, the lion, the patient in lion down position is the best position to do that, the supine position. Good, very good, I'm happy. <laughs> Next question is, uh, what is the best transducer to perform focus DVT? Oh, this is going really fast. <laughs> okay, we're at 50%, so another couple of seconds for you guys to respond. And... Here are the results. Okay, 95% responded linear proband 12 to 3 megahertz. The, the best is the linear, of course. The best is the linear. And please notice that I not the, the question has not only the type, convex linear and phase the rate, the type of traducer, but also has the, the frequency. So working with a convex with four to two megahertz 
it's almost impossible to 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 see uh, or to obtain a, a, a good image. So uh, 95% responded well with the linear broadband 12 to 3 megahertz. Thank you. Last question is, what is the best technique to diagnose DVT with compressive ultrasound? And you should see the options on your screen. Right. We are at fifty percent of people who are here who responded. So I'll give another couple of seconds for everyone. All right, two answers are very close to each other. <laughs> okay, let's share these results. Okay, very good. Uh, please pay attention in the question. What is the best, the best technique? I think that the best technique is to use the extended technique because you go popliteal and then you go to the tibioperoneal confluence. But if you do three points or three regions, you are doing a, a valid kind of test. And if you are doing two points, there are some uh, very important places around the world that they, they recommend, and there are some guidelines still recommended two points. But three points is better than two points. Uh, so it means that if you perform two points, you are doing well. If you perform three points, you are doing well. But I think that the best is the extended, the extended technique with B-mode and compressive maneuver. Perfect, thank you so much. And now we go into Q&A part. So feel free to submit your questions uh, in the Q&A box. So I'll start with the first one. Um, do you check gastronomial branches uh, routinely um, when you do the check? Yes, we do. Yes, we and, do. Okay, and if, if uh, are they in the same position or prone? Uh, normally we do it in the same position. If we have uh, some kind of difficulty to see well, if you do it in prone position and you rise a little bit for 30 or 45 degrees, the leg, of course you, 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 you will, the, the vein will be uh, uh, more completely uh, filled with, with, with the blood. So you can see better the popliteal and you can see better uh, this gastronomius. But normally we do it and normally we can obtain the information. If we have some kind of difficulty or doubt, so turn the patient to the prone position. Perfect, thank you. Can you please share some uh, information about the D-dimer? Okay, is the, the D-dimer, it's an, an, excellent, uh, an excellent tool with a very, very high sensitivity uh, to detect uh, venous thrombosis. Uh, if you have a, a negative D-dimer, a negative D-dimer, with high probability, your patient has no DVT. No DVT is the dimer, uh, is the D dimer or dimer is negative. When you have a positive dimer, okay, probably you will have a DVT. But remember that DVT is not the only cause to the elevation or to the increased values of, of the D dimer. Uh, pregnancy, uh, patient, older patient. Uh, patients with some kind of trauma, patient after surgery can have without a DVT an elevated value of the D dimer. But it is fantastic to have a D dimer before we, uh, we do our POCUS. But we can perform the POCUS in the meantime that we are waiting for the result of the D dimer because the POCUS you are going to have you are going to have the immediate response of the, your, uh, your binary study. 
Perfect. Thank you. We have a lot of questions coming in. So next one, if the pain is just in the cough, do you, and you find evidence of DVT there, is it important to also check it more proximally? Please do it because for example, it is well known that at least 20 or 25% of the gastronomous thrombosis can go to the popliteal. And after reaching the popliteal vein, it's very easy with a high probability that the thrombus continue, continues to the, uh, to the femoral vein. Thank you. And the next question is, what is the best location to check perineal vein? The perineal vein? Yes. Okay. Uh, sometimes I prefer to, uh, to uh, with the leg in an in a anatomic position, start. Then we do a flexion of the knee. The, 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 uh, the foot is placed on the, on the bed. And then you can go with the transducer in transversal position and you can uh, place it uh, in one side of the, of the fibula, of the tibia. And then you will find the peroneal and you will find the tibial posterior ray. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, do you routinely examine a ATV? ATV? Mm, please tell, tell me I think it's, what it stands uh, for. Anterior tibial vein. Okay, when we perform our study in our ultrasound department, in our ultrasound laboratory, we study the tibial, anterior and posterior. Yes, we do it routine, in, in routine. But this is not the focus. This is the full study. And we think that a full study must start in the inguinal region, and then you study all the segments you study the femoral vein in all his path, its path, then go to the popliteal, go down with a, with a, or to the gastrodemius vein, and then in 1.5 centimeters in deep, if you position in transversal uh, your your transducer in the middle portion of the leg, not the not the side, just the leg. Uh, you will you will find the tibial, uh, double tibial, uh, posterior tibial veins, and the anterior is uh, more difficult to see because are are smallest, are smaller than the other ones, but we explored we explored all the all the uh, all the uh, the vascular net of, of the leg, and in our lab we explore both legs. Always in routine, but in focus, but in focus, you go to see if you have a DVT in two points or two regions or three regions or the extended because his focus is different. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question is um, from. Uh, anonymous person, <laughs> not sure what their name is, but I have a question about the false positive issue. If there are any key point that made the false positive result while we performed the exam, if I got a positive, should I better perform further evaluation including CTA? No, it's enough, depending on the protocols established in your center. But if you have a clinical suspicion of DVT, and you go and see echogenicity inside the vessel, and you do the compressive maneuver, it's enough. And then, of course, you will you will have, or the patient will have a DD a D dimer positive. It's enough. It's not necessary to increase the cost with a CT, and it's not necessary to expose the patient. To, to radiation. It's enough with the ultrasound. Great. Um, do you have any guidance on subacute DVT? Uh, subacute, uh, I, I show you the fresh thrombus, the recent thrombus, and I show you the, the older thrombus. 
Uh, remember that I, I, I mentioned that we, the, the, the thrombus is anechoic or hypoechoic, and that the thrombus transform itself in a hyperechogenic. So when you have partial transformation or, or the characteristic is, is changing step by step, then you can see or you can think in subacute. If we need or if we want to use the time, time frame, we can say that an acute thrombus is the thrombus with seven days in evolution. And it is good to ask to the patient when your symptom started. After the seven day uh, and, and uh, until the day 28, the day 28 is not, yeah, the day 28 now is a chronic thrombus. So please use seven to 10 days, then 10 days to 15 or to 21 days, and then more than 21, better 28, you can think that you have a chronic. So acute, subacute, and, and chronic thrombus. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a couple more questions and I think we have some time. Um, thank you for excellent presentation. Um, the question is, which are the main normal vein anatomical variations to be aware of? So, um, yeah, okay. that's the question. Let, let me see if I understood well. Uh, normally, we can have duplication of veins. Uh, it, it happens very frequent, frequently with the femoral vein. In the past called femoral superficial vein. We don't use this, this, uh, this uh, uh, denomination anymore because of the confusion. The femoral vein is a deep vein. And this vein can, can, be, uh, founded, can be founded duplicated. And we have seen in two femoral veins, one is... Uh, it, it has a DVT and the other one has no DVT. So it can happen. Uh, the, pop the popliteal vein also can be duplicated, but with less frequency than the femoral vein. So if I have to choose one, which is the most important that we have to be aware, of, the femoral vein. Great, thank you. Another question is, do we report slow flow with internal Echoes inside the vein or not? Yes, we do it because uh, because uh, this is slow flow can be thrombogenic and needs treatment. What kind of treatment? Depending on the patient, for example, use some socks in order to uh, compressive socks, for example, in, in order to uh, to to stimulate the the circulation. Uh, exercises, some kind of physical therapy, uh, not necessary drugs, not necessary uh, pharmacological. There is some hemorrheologic, this is the name, hemorrheologic uh, 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 substances that can help, like diosmin, for example, uh, that can help with this, uh, with the return of the flow. But yes, please uh, report that make the physician uh, be sure that, that, that the physician can be aware, aware that something not normal is happening. Sometimes we can find this in all the system, not only in the gastronomies, but in all the venous system. Depending if unilateral or bilateral, you have to think in pelvic, uh, in pelvic pathology. It's a, it's a uterus carcinoma, it's a, it's a problem with the prostate, depending on the patient, but these signs must be reported. I think that it is important to let the referral physician uh, to know what is happening. Great. I, there are two follow-up questions on this. Um, is there a Doppler velocity cutoff to define slow flow? No, I don't know a number. What? Why we can say that it's a low flow? Remember that in a normal velocity, 
the the B mode ultrasound cannot see uh, the the red blood cells on the elements of all the elements of, of, of the of the of the blood. When this velocity decreased, the past of the these elements, red blood cells and all of uh, all, all, and all the elements, uh, but mainly red blood cells, now these cells can be seen, can be heard by the ultrasound and represented in our screen. That's the reason because we assume that there is a, a, a very a very slow flow that allows us to see with a normal B mode, with a normal B mode, this expression of the red cells. There are some companies that they have a special softwares. For example, one of these softwares is the B-Flow. Uh, the B-Flow is a trademark software that allows you to see the normal flow not seen with a B-Mode without this software. So please don't make confusion with that because when you use when you use the B float trademark uh, software, you will see all the flows with normal velocity, but you will see the, the has, has a, a slow flow. Without this software, if you see these tiny, tiny echoes moving there, this is not normal. This is pathologic and we, we need to report that. Right, and another question, how do you actually describe the slow flow on the report? Do you have any tips on that? Well, I mentioned, I mentioned that in the given day, let's see, muscular rates, uh, we can observe uh, echogenicity material inside uh, with low amplitude is the proper name. It's low amplitude echogenicity. Low amplitude echogenicity inside inside uh, the muscular veins that uh, with slow motion uh, for, with a slow motion and uh, with normal compression uh, maneuver. This is the way that I describe that comparable with a slow flow in my conclusions. The cardiologist they say they, they, uh, they have an expression. For slow flow also in in the in the inside the, the ventricles, uh, and they use the expressions uh, spontaneous contrast image, spontaneous contrast image. So sometimes we 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 take this expression for the cardiologist, and we could say we are observing uh, spontaneous uh, uh, contrast uh, inside echogenicity inside. Uh, the muscular veins. Sometimes we use that. Perfect, thank you. And the last question, I think then uh, we have a little bit more time. Um, I guess Sonia uh, is asking, what should be the correct sequence of scanning? Everyone has different protocols. How do you scan it? Um, if okay. you share some tips. Okay, okay, focus. The, the, we are focused in, 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 in focus today, okay? So we start, I start, and all my team start, start uh, at the inguinal region, and, and we go with, with the extended. One, one region, inguinal, we go to the middle portion of the thigh, we do compression there. Then we go the, to the popliteal, and we do the compression, and we see the tibial peroneal confluence and the muscular. This is in focus that, 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 that normally, we do, and our all, all, all our team is well prepared, and we have the consensus to do to do like that. Uh, but I said during the lecture that in some countries, some sonographists they prefer to start in the popliteal area, and then go up, and they go up. So it doesn't matter. The the the, the important thing here, if you choose one protocol, always follow this protocol follow this protocol in order to don't forget something or, 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 or miss some region or something. Or if you decide to go from proximal to distal, this is good. If you decide to go distal to proximal, this is good. If you 
decided to do two points, it's good, but better if you do three points and much better if you do the extended. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez. It was such an incredible presentation and even better discussion. Uh, we really appreciate it. We are at time. So I just want to thank everyone who attended today's webinar. Uh, this was recorded, so you can access this recording next week and you'll get an uh, email. And uh, just a reminder, uh, you know, fill out the learning score questions that we posted for you. Just we were trying to understand, did you learn anything today? Should we bring more uh, presentations like that? Also, we hope to see you in September at our Pocus World Conference. I will have more presentations like this. It'll be a two-day event. It will be virtual, so hopefully you can join us. Again, thank you so much, everyone. And Dr. Fernandez, thank you again. We hope to see you soon for another presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much.